Welcome everyone to Learn at Lunchtime. So glad you guys could join us. Right now, we're going to be bringing in Brad Smith, and he is the program director here at the State Museum. All right. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Curator's Choice, a program of our Learn at Lunchtime series. As Sherry mentioned, I'm Bradley Smith, and the program I'll be presenting today is called Artifact Legends from the State Museum. I'm going to start my presentation by talking about a legend from my own family's history. It involves this property, a farm in the vicinity of Anvil, Pennsylvania, which is in Lebanon County. This was the farm of my great, 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 great grandparents, John and Anna Bachman. And there you see a close up view of the house. And this is my grandmother, Rosanna Hitz. And when I was a boy, she told me a fascinating story about this property. She told me that this house was built by John Bachman, my ancestor, but he designed it in collaboration with a fairly famous American you might've heard of, Thomas Jefferson. When I was first hearing this story, I was probably 10 years old. I had no reason to doubt its authenticity. I just assumed it was true. As an adult, I started looking into this story, wanting to learn more about it. And I found that this story can be found on Facebook. So therefore it must be true. <clears throat> what I did find interesting however, is that um, because it is out there on the internet, on Facebook, that suggests to me that this story did not originate with my grandmother, that it's a larger, a larger story that has been told by our family for quite some time. But I wanted to find more documentation. As much as I trusted our family's history and as much as I trusted my grandmother, my feeling was that I needed to find some sort of documentation to, to verify this story. So I went to one of my favorite websites, Founders Online. I have the website address there. It's an excellent website. And as you see highlighted, it contains over 181,000 searchable documents related to the founding fathers. And I went into the Thomas Jefferson files and you'll see there between digital records received by Jefferson and sent by Jefferson, this website has almost 47, well, over 47,000 digital documents that one can search through a searchable database. So I thought if the story is true, if Thomas Jefferson really did design this house in collaboration with my ancestor, John Bachman, there should be some sort of surviving correspondence, a letter, a reference in a diary, something. But of those 47,000 Thomas Jefferson documents, there's not a single mention of the Bachman family. And there's really only one mention of Anvil, Pennsylvania, and it is completely unrelated to my family. So this cast considerable doubt on the story. On top of that, the story kind of fails a basic logic test. Jefferson became president in uh, the early 1800s, shortly after the Capitol had moved to Washington, DC. This house was supposedly built in 1813 a few years, about four years after Jefferson had retired and was living in Mount Vernon. It just does not quite hold up to logic that Jefferson from Washington DC or from Mount, or I'm sorry, Monticello, not Mount Vernon, uh, from Washington DC or from Monticello, it doesn't make sense that he would be interacting with this Pennsylvania German family from the hinterlands of Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. So I hate to say it, but the verdict is this story is probably false. 
Now you might be wondering, how does this connect to the State Museum? It connects to the State Museum because we apply the same type of logic with our history collections. And just a few notes on the history collections. We have over 150,000 objects in our history collections alone. That doesn't even include sciences and archeology. span Each one of these objects potentially has a story to tell, but we feel it's important for us to tell accurate stories. The reason we feel this is, is validated by research that's been happening today. For example, here's the, the results of one research study which found that museums are considered the most trustworthy source of information in America, rated higher than local newspapers, the US government and academic researchers. Another study found that museums are considered a more reliable source of historical information than books, teachers, or even personal accounts by relatives. As I read these quotes, I feel strengthened in the conviction that as a museum, it's very important for us to get the story right, to really dig into primary documents, to do appropriate research, to not just accept artifact legends as fact. So with that in mind, I'm gonna to talk today about a few of my favorite artifact legends. The first one is the legend of Augustus Kyle's drum. Augustus Kyle was a man from Newville, Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. And uh, this drum was allegedly used by him in the Civil War. One of the first things I do when I'm looking at the veracity of an artifact legend is I look at the chain of custody. Has the artifact stayed within one family or has it been passed around from owner to owner to owner? The tighter that chain of custody, the more likely it is that stories associated with it are true. And fortunately for Augustus Kyle's drum, we have a very nice chain of custody. It was donated to the State Museum by his great granddaughter. So that's a very good sign. That's something we like to see. Also, records show, government records show that Augustus Kyle was indeed a drummer with first the 130th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry and then the 187th Pennsylvania. And this document is just one of many records pertaining to his military service. We have a photograph of Augustus Kyle showing that he was in fact a drummer. And probably the most exciting item we have inside the drum is a note written by Augustus Kyle himself. And it says, quote, this drum was carried by A.G. Kyle of the Fighting 130th Regiment PA Volunteers Infantry in my first enlistment during the War of the Great Rebellion. So the verdict with this legend is absolutely true. I have to admit, I picked this one on purpose because it's a nice well-documented artifact. This is often not the case. Next one I'd like to talk about is the legend of George Washington's hair, part one. When I say part one, we actually have two separate locks of George Washington's hair with completely separate histories. The first one here came to the State Museum from Valley Forge historic site. And we know that Valley Forge received it sometime before 1902 from a woman named Ellen Sargent who lived in Philadelphia. I actually looked into her will and sure enough in her will it says, I give and bequeath to the society at General Washington's headquarters at Valley Forge, the bracelet containing George Washington's hair. However, this, is, this will is from 1900 this is the first instance we can find any documentation related to this hair. So this doesn't prove that this came from George Washington, but what it does show is that at least in 1900, she was the owner and she believed that 
it was from George Washington. I mentioned chain of custody is an important consideration we look at in the museum field. So I dug a little bit into Ellen Sargent's family and I found that interestingly, her grandfather was a man named Jonathan Sargent. He was a pretty important person. He was a member of the Second Continental Congress, Attorney General of Pennsylvania, and a member of the American Philosophical Society, uh, a, an organization where many founding fathers were involved. Given that he was in Philadelphia in the 1770s, 80s, and 90s, it's very, very possible he had connections with George Washington. It's very possible that he would have received a lock of his hair. The problem is there's just no documentation to verify this. We have no documentation any earlier than that will from 1900. So for this one, the verdict is plausible but can't be proven. Now we have another lock of George Washington's hair. This one is a, a slightly different story. This came to us from a man named Elbridge McConkie who donated it to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1875. He received it from his father, David McConkie. And David McConkie received it from a man named Robert Westcott in 1844. Robert Westcott's a, a key person. He lived in Philadelphia. So that puts him in the right place at the right time uh, for quite some time. And he wrote a note that still survives and is with the hair. And that's where we know that it came from this man, John Pieri, who was a barber who allegedly gave Washington a haircut in 1797, saved the lock of his hair, gave it to Robert Westcott. The story makes sense. It checks out. But actually, I'm going to just say, remember that name, John Pieri, however. Just about three months ago, this headline appeared in newspapers across the United States. Lock of George Washington's hair sells for almost $40,000. And there you can see the hair is in sort of a, a little uh, locket. With that locket was a note. And sure enough, the note says General Washington's hair cut from his head in the year 1799 by Mr. John Pieri of Philadelphia. So here we have another example of hair cut by John Pieri. John Pieri and his father were both well-known barbers and interestingly, locks of hair from George Washington attributed to these two barbers have been appearing all over the place. The Library Company of Philadelphia has one, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania has one, and then the State Museum has one. Now, if we go back to this chain of custody, this all makes sense. It's the right people in the right places at the right time with a clean custody trail. But this whole legend is based on one key thing, which we can't know for certain. It's a true story if John Pieri was being honest. And you might wonder, well, why would he be dishonest? There are some who think, some who've speculated if there are all these pieces of hair out there that came from this person, and we know he was cutting hair every single day, is it possible that he cheated a little bit and just used whatever hair was laying on the floor and handed them out, alleging a connection to George Washington as a way to sort of promote himself and his own business? That is one line of speculation. We just don't know if it's true. But it does seem that this hair did definitely come from John Pieri. So again, the verdict for this is true if Pieri was being honest. Next item I'm gonna talk about is the Gettysburg flag. The Gettysburg flag 
was allegedly, well, I should back up and say that what we know for a fact is that it was transferred from the PA Adjutant General to the State Museum of Pennsylvania around 1915. Yes, we were around even back then. So that's a key piece of information to remember. But uh, what's really special about this flag is that allegedly this was on display the day that Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address in November 1863. The Gettysburg Address, considered by many to be one of the most important speeches in the United States history. And this flag was there, was witness to it. Question is, is that story true? One of the things I did was I looked at old photographs taken from the day. And here's an example. This is another very famous example. And historians believe that man right there, circled in red, is Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you see behind him, there is a flag visible from in the background. However, I am of the opinion that this is an American flag uh, based on the fact that it's darker at the top and lighter at the bottom. But that's, that's just, it's just too hard to tell for sure. Here's a photograph and in this photograph, one can see at least three flags, but the details are just so, it, they're just too distant to really discern if any of these might be the state flag that wound its way to our collection. I next looked into a story that the flag might have been on display at the Great Central Fair of the United States Sanitary Commission, which was in Philadelphia in June 1864. And the reason we think this was the case, well, here's a photo actually showing some of the displays at the fair. We know for a fact there were many flags, many items, thousands and thousands of items on display at this fair. But a key piece of information can be found in the Pittsburgh Gazette of June 13, 1864. And it's talking about a display of flags at the fair. It says, upon its left is the now historical blue silk flag displayed at the dedication of the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. The device is a circle of gilt stars enclosed in the coat of arms of Pennsylvania, which is beautifully painted. So that sounds like a pretty credible story, especially considering that's less than one year after Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. A year later, we see the flag pop up in an inventory of state-owned flags. And there you can see one state flag used at Gettysburg Cemetery dedication. The flag next appears again in a report by the Pennsylvania Adjutant General in 1896. And in their inventory, they just list the flag as Lincoln. And then below, you can see highlighted, it's a little hard to read, but it says this flag was held by President Lincoln while he delivered his famous oration at Gettysburg in 1864. I've never ever seen it said anywhere else that Lincoln was actually holding a flag, much less a Pennsylvania state flag while I gave the address. So I don't think that part of the story, that comment by the adjutant general is accurate. But what's important is we see here a chain of custody, 1864, 1865, 1896. And then you might recall, I mentioned that it was the adjutant general's office who gave it to the state museum in 1915. So that's a pretty nice chain of custody. So the verdict for this one is that this is probably true, provided that between 1865 and 1896, nobody got the flag mixed up. I will also mention that uh, there is a maker's mark on the flag and the maker was someone who was only in business until 1869. So the time period is also correct uh, for the manufacturer. So it, it does seem like this may very well be true, provided there was no mix up 
in the late 1800s. The fourth and final legend I want to talk about is Conrad Weiser Spoon. Now, this spoon actually is technically a part of the State Museum's collection, but it's currently on loan at the Conrad Weiser Homestead in Wilmersdorf, Pennsylvania. We don't know too much about it, except that it was donated by a Mrs. S.F. Weiser, Pottsville, who was an alleged descendant on an unknown date. That's, uh, I haven't looked into that too much, but that's at least a start, but a, a little bit vague. If this is true, this is very significant. Conrad Weiser, and incidentally, this is a, a drawing done of Conrad Weiser in the 1800s. There are no contemporary images of Conrad Weiser. This one was done in the 1800s. And, um, but, um, if this is true, if this spoon actually belonged to Conrad Weiser, it's significant because he was an extremely important part of early Pennsylvania history and someone for whom there are just not many surviving artifacts. I looked into Conrad Weiser's estate inventory and sure enough, it does list 14 large silver spoons were in his possession at the time he died in 1760. It doesn't mean that our spoon is one of those 14, but it's possible. Something else interesting, however, is that two other similar spoons have popped up, both with alleged connections to Conrad Weiser. One is at the Lutheran Archives in Philadelphia. The other is at the Burke's History Center in Reading, Pennsylvania. All three of these Conrad Weiser spoons the one in our collection, the one in Reading, and the one in Philadelphia, have this marking on the back. And one has to wonder, are these the initials of Conrad Weiser, C.W., and his wife, Anna Eve Weiser, A.E.W.? I believe they are. Also, now, I, I, fortunately, I don't have a very good photo of this, but the spoons, all three of the spoons, also have the maker's mark of a very famous Philadelphia silversmith, Philip Singh. That puts it in the right time period. And an interesting side note, Philip Singh is very famous for having designed and created the silver set used when they, uh, the silver ink well set used when they signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in Philadelphia. The next very interesting clue I found came in a book, came in a book written by Con, excuse me, written about Conrad Weiser in 1876, The Life of Conrad Weiser. And this book talks about Elizabeth Lures, described then as the oldest living descendant of Conrad Weiser, his great granddaughter. And the book says that she possessed, quote, a large silver spoon, 150 years old. And it also adds that it was a souvenir of Conrad Weiser. Now, this is very interesting because Elizabeth Lures, as the book mentions, was the great granddaughter of Conrad Weiser, not that too far removed from him. And her grandson, a man named Oliver Wolf, is the man who donated the spoon, which is now in the possession of the Burke's History Center in the early 1900s. So while we don't have a good chain of custody for the spoon in our collection, the spoon in Reading has a very good chain of custody going from the donor to Conrad Weiser. So based on that chain of custody, the estate inventory and the, the initials on the spoon, uh, on each of the spoons, I think this one is true. I think this one is true. So in conclusion, you, you might be wondering why do all this research? We are digging and digging and digging just to be able to say, yes, it's probably true or no, it's unlikely. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, 
accurate information is very important to museums. It's important to the state museum. And uh, I'm inspired by the words of David Scorton, secretary of the Smithsonian, when he said the following, the trustworthiness of information is based on the perceived trustworthiness of the source. Since our founding, this nation has consistently placed that trust in its museums and libraries. Even today, libraries and museums are considered honest purveyors of information. So in that spirit, we at the State Museum are always gonna try and thoroughly research our artifacts so that we can share the most accurate stories possible with the public. That concludes my talk, but I'd be very happy to receive any questions you might have. And it looks like we do have some questions coming up. Right, and use the Q&A box to put your questions in. So the first question, a very good question, has any DNA testing been done on the hair locks? The answer is yes. I was actually reading recently that two separate locks of Washington's hair were tested. However, this was about 20, 25 years ago when that science was in its infancy. What they found was that both locks they tested, and I, I forget the who these locks resided with, uh, but both were in fact definitely connected in some way to the Washington family. It would be interesting to see more modern testing done now that the science has improved so much with DNA testing. However, most people who have locks of Washington's hair are hesitant to, to do that testing because they, they would be destructive and at least some of the hair would be lost in the process. And I have not read about any DNA testing in the last 15 or 20 years. Another question, do we have any other famous hair in our collection? My, if I recall correctly, the State Archives has a lock of Thomas Jefferson's hair, but I don't recall any others here at the State Museum. But I could be wrong. That is one I will definitely look into. And then when Sherry sends her post-meeting or post-program email follow-up, we will, we will um, share what we found. If there is any additional example in the collection, we'll let you know. Next question, what do you think about the legend of the Treaty Elm? So the Treaty Elm, uh, for those of you who aren't acquainted with it, the Treaty Elm is a large tree that was in the uh, vicinity of Philadelphia where allegedly William Penn signed a famous treaty with the Delaware Indians. And uh, in the 1700s and early 1800s, the Treaty Elm was kind of seen as a very important symbol of Pennsylvania history, even though the veracity of the actual Treaty Elm story was questionable even then in the 1700s and 1800s. At one point, the tree came down in a storm, I believe 1820s, 1830s in that vicinity, and collectors made lots of items from the Treaty Elm. In, in our collection, we have a chair allegedly made from the, the wood of that Treaty Elm. There are artifacts all over the place in, uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania in particular that have connections to the Treaty Elm. I, my opinion is that I absolutely believe that uh, the, these items were taken from that tree that fell down in circa 1830. What I'm not sure of, and I'm not an expert on that subject, but I'm not sure of the veracity of the claim that there actually was a treaty signed at that tree. An important distinction to make is that William Penn signed many, many treaties with Native American groups. 
uh, Native American leaders. And um, there very well could have been a treaty signed there. I'm just not sure. And I don't know if there's any way to, to ever know for certain, except to say that in the late 1700s and early 1800s, people believed it. People knew that legend and believed it. So I don't see any other questions. So if that's it for questions, Sherry, maybe I'll turn it over to you for some closing comments. Um, so we've got a lot of upcoming programs that are gonna be coming up. Um, next week, we're gonna be meeting with the director, Beth Hager, and she's gonna be talking about volunteering, coming back to the State Museum, what we've done in the past, what we're looking forward to looking for in the future. Um, Brad, we're going to return back here. We're going to add a treasurer's uh, one here, uh, July 30th, um, about the parachute wedding dress um, from World War II. And uh, then we're going to come back to our artist conversations with Tekla's Ladder. And then we're going to do Pennsylvania Turtles and then back around again on August 20th uh, with Brad again uh, for our curator's choice. And this one's going to be an interesting one. We're going to be talking about um, Colonel Paul Avanks. I'm hoping I'm doing that name right, on 9-11 Field Notes, which thanks everybody for joining us. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you again soon.